Hi and welcome back to Buffs Vintage Bikes. In this video I'm going to take you through the restoration of this Colnago Super. It's somewhat of a special bike because it belongs to Conrad Stoltz. For those who haven't heard of the name, Conrad is somewhat of a South African triathlete icon. He is the four times Xterra Triathlon World Cup champ. He's the three times ITU Cross Triathlon World Champ. He's a two times Olympian and he's a winner of hundreds of other races. After being a pro athlete for over 23 years, representing Specialized for most of that time, Conrad is now retired and lives close by in the town of Stellenbosch near Cape Town. He spends most of his time nowadays building mountain bike trails some of the most amazing trails you'll ever have the privilege of riding and he also does specialized coaching I'll post a link in the description of this video below to Conrad's website you can have a look at what this man has managed to achieve in his life and what he now keeps himself busy with strangely enough I met Conrad in something totally unrelated to cycling we both have a passion for dirt biking and we share a mutual friend also lives in Stellenbosch who has the most amazing trail that we get to ride. So I bumped into Conrad while we were riding that trail the one day. He's equally impressive on a dirt bike as what he is on a mountain bike and he uses those long legs to his advantage to get through technical pieces. So as you can see the strip down of this frame already happened when I decided to make this video. Initially I wasn't going to as a Colnago Super is obviously not a South African built bike. But considering who it belonged to, I thought I'd go ahead and make a video anyway. Conrad approached me to do this restoration after watching some of my previous videos. He felt I was the right person to do justice to his old bike. This Colnago Super has belonged to Conrad since his school days. He's done many training miles on this bike. The bike is somewhat of a special place in his heart, for obvious reasons. A good few years ago, he managed to crack the right hand chainstay on the bike. The bike then went into the legendary Bill Lunger, a retired South African frame builder, renowned for building exceptional frames, to replace the chainstay. The frame itself was built from Columbus tubing, but the chainstay was replaced with a Reynolds tube and the frame was resprayed. Conrad decided against a full respray on the bike again. So as you can see I was pointing out all the issues on the frame, scratches that it had built up over the years from a few hard knocks. The idea here was just to touch up those spots as best as possible to try and avoid future rust creep going forward. Ruby, what you up to? Look at the hole in my grass. The joys of having a puppy around. So as I take you through this restoration, I'll narrate here and there, and other places I'll keep quiet, so you can just watch what I'm busy with. The start off was obviously the full strip down, and a good degreasing so I could have a good look at what I was dealing with. The bike was running a full Shimano 600 group set, but it had seen better days as well. Conrad's aim is to take this bike back to original full C record group set, but he's still in the process of collecting all those pieces. For now, I'm just going to restore the 600 group set as best as possible and then do all the paint touch-ups. So here I started with the frame cleanup using mostly anything I can find in the situation from nail files to sandpaper to mini carpet knives basically whatever it takes to get the job done that can be effective in scraping off some of the rust Once I've cleaned up all the rust spots on the frame as best as possible, 
I'll then prep all the rust spots using a rust converter. In most instances I'll leave this overnight and sometimes I'll use two coats of the converter on it. You can be fairly liberal with it in this case because once it's complete and it's dried you can go back and clean the frame afterwards to get rid of excess that has managed to creep onto the clear coat. Yeah, I was just continuing touching up all those little rust spots. Basically every piece of exposed metal you can find you can apply that rust converter to. Yeah, I'm cleaning up the rear dropout. They had been resprayed with the previous respray of the bike. And I just wanted to expose the Campagnolo detailing on it, as well as a frame stamp number in there. So I scraped them clean and then I hit them with water paper afterwards and then polished them up using the trusty water saw. Then it was time to touch up the decals. They had a few spots where they had picked up scrapes. The decals in this case were vinyl, but they had been clear coated. So touch up was basically the only way I could go here. Yeah, I'm trying to clean up the rust that's on the fork crown. Obviously the crown being chrome. So in this instance I was using WD-40 as a lubricant. And then a jeweler's screwdriver just to scrape off the worst of it. And I combine that with aluminum or aluminum foil just to scrape down most of that rust. rust. And then once that's done polish it up with water salt as well. This was the other side of the fork crown. It was in a little worse condition so it needed a bit more attention to get it looking good. So after leaving the rust converter on overnight, this was the next day when I went back to the frame and then with a little bit of a cutting compound I went over the entire frame. Well not the entire frame actually but all the spots where I'd applied the rust converter and this will get rid of all the excess that had spilt over onto the clear coat. 
So in the video you can see some of the excess sort of in a different color. And you can see as I rub it how the, the um, cutting compound gets rid of all that excess. So once you've done this and you've cleaned it up, you should be left with little spots of converted metal. So then I use a solution on rubbing alcohol. Basically go and clean up those areas just to get rid of the compound on them before I apply a base coat to it. This frame had a two-part pearlescent white spray job. So getting a match was basically impossible. I had economic motor spares in observatory match it as best as possible. And then I combined the base coat with the pearlescent coat when I was doing the touch-ups. It wasn't perfect by a long shot. But it wasn't too bad either. This is the touch up that's been applied just underneath the top tube. So it's a base mixed with the pearlescent that I've just touched on a, with a paintbrush. Because there's really nothing else you can do for these marks. So I'm going to flat that back now with a water paper 2000 grit. Then I'm going to polish it with a metal polish autosol. And then after that I'm going to hit it with a normal wax polish. And we'll see what result we can get. Hopefully we can blend it just a little bit better. These raised spots are actually on top of the existing paint. So I want to get rid of that with the water paper. There are just the raised spots. So this bottom chip I've already gone at it with the water paper. And the top one I'm going to, I'm busy with. So you just keep working it like this until you remove the paint on the edges, you only have the paint that is in the valley. Ideally you want to build that valley up with paint so that it's flush with your top coat. And if you, let me get the focus right, if you have a good clear coat on your frame, you shouldn't go through it with a 2000 water paper. Uh, the clear coat, especially if it's a 2k clear coat, you won't easily be able to go through it. And then once you polish it, you'll notice with this one, it's already a, you can see the dullness around it where I've been rubbing it with the water paper. As soon as I hit that with the metal polish, it will bring that color, that clear coat back. Um, that's if you have a decent clear coat on your frame. And that's the result afterwards. Really hard to see. You can see no more dullness around it. Just from autosol and then a wax polish on it afterwards. Okay, I'm just doing some stem cleanup over here and you'll see these scratches. There's quite a deep gouge there. See if we can get this to focus a little bit. There's some scratches over here. There we go, you can see that. So I'm using a, a jeweler's fine file. I'm just taking those down, they look more acceptable and then I'll hit it with water paper to get rid of the jeweler's file scratches and, uh, and then really fine water paper to smooth it all off once we finish to get the shine going and then autosol metal polish to get it looking like new again. Okay, so that's the work after I've been at it with the jeweler's file just to get the worst of those scratches out and now I'm actually going to hit it with some scotch pot, scotch pot pad that thick. So instead of going wet paper, I'm going to see what result I can get out of a scotch pot pad first. Maybe I'm able to avoid using wet paper altogether. So let's give it a try. I can always go back to wet paper if I need to. So that was probably about five minutes on the on the wheel. That's the finish I got. So it almost a burnished finish if we get close. You can see some of the 
lines in the aluminium or aluminium as those in the states like to call it uh, so I'm going to put a slightly finer scotch brite pad in now see if we can get rid of some of these deeper scratches that's going over it with a slightly finer pad probably another few minutes that I spent on it just to get the slightly deeper scratches out that the previous pad put into it you can see that's still got a few scratches on it but really not too bad and I'm going to take this straight onto the polishing wheel also on the drill so I've got a little polishing wheel that looks like that it's quite small as well and I'm just going to put autosol on that and uh, let's see what kind of result we get out of that That's after autosol. Now you'll see is it's polished, it's looking good. But if you take a closer look, you can see some really you can still see some fine lines in there. So that's from that first Scotch Bright pad, which was a little bit too aggressive uh, when I used used it. So although the overall stem looks pretty good. We can still get it a lot better than that. So I'm gonna take I'm gonna take some water paper now and rub it down with water paper to get rid of all those really fine marks. And then we're gonna hit it with water soil once again. Righto, so we're back again after the water paper. This took exactly 30 minutes or almost one full half of a rugby game. So I used 800 paper, 1,200 and then 2,000 paper and now I'm going to hit it with autosol again and we'll see how it turns out. Righty ho, so that's it, done with autosol on the wheel after the wet paper and I'm happy with that. I can see my reflection very clearly in it. And uh, very nicely. So yes, in restoration there are no shortcuts worth taking. If you want to get a good shine to it, take the time going through all the grades of water paper and you'll be rewarded with a with a deep shine. Moving on to the headset, just having the general condition. Look at the condition, sorry. There's a campy headset as well, still nice original. Not too bad a condition, greasing there now, but not too much pitting there. Actually very little. Bit of rust on the edges here, which will get cleaned up. The lock ring. A couple of burrs on the edge of it. We will get those cleaned up as well. I've got the lock ring clamped in the vise and now all I'm going to do is just take my file and wrap it just one layer to get something thick you could use anything I just find the file works best and then where the dirt is in that lock ring just get in there and give it a clean It gets in there nicely and cleans all the dirt out and then once I'm done with that I'll take a fine jeweler's file and just work these little burrs off the edges and just clean up this lock ring nicely so that's the size of the jeweler's file almost fits in there really nice and small and then just work these edges here with 
Let's see, get that bird off of it. Use the shaky camera. I'm trying to do this with one hand, which is obviously not ideal. You can see how it just takes an edge off of that that burr and gives it a nice flat face to to bite on when you use the spanner. And the result is a nice clean lock ring with square edges. And that's what you want. See, I missed some dirt. Moving on to the seat post, the cleanup. It's also a campy 27.2 post. Lovely old Campag logo, and not too scratched either. Actually, looking quite good as far as seat posts go. So it's some work over here that I'll I'll put this on the Scotch Pride wheel as well. Get rid of all that rust. That'll take it off really quickly, and then we'll get the seat post polished up as well as what the stem was. Quite looking forward to seeing how this turns out. All the pitting gone, just on the scotch pad wheel. And here's the post. I haven't even touched it with polish yet. Just on the scotch part wheel. You see the campy logo turned out lovely. All cleaned out at the top. Size much more visible. Okay, it goes without saying that if you're going to do this with a scotch part pad, make sure you're using a fine pad. The last thing you want to do is to be a, use an aggressive pad and damage things like engraved logos. So yes, I've, I used a very fine pad on this one. This is what it looks like. You can see it's actually well worn this pad as well, which is why I actually used it. Because the edges get a bit softer and then your work is far gentle. So you can use these pads until they're totally destroyed and each one will have a different purpose at some stage. So now I'm just going to put a little bit of polish on it and get the seat post cleaned up with the polish. So there we have it all polished up. That took exactly 11.4 kilometers of the Jira till the sprint to get it finished up. And uh, you can see a bit of a reflection going there. Lovely Campag logo. Still preserved. One or two small marks there. I didn't want to go too deep into the seat post to get them out. And that just adds to the patina to show it's not in, entirely flawless. Yeah, seat post matching the stem with the polish. Okay, so now for the honesty section. Because Conrad has been unable to get a set of C record brake levers for this bike yet, as an interim, we're going to put a period correct non aero lever on it. But we're going for the cheap Chinese knockoff. Yes, I know sacrilege on a Colnago, but it'll be just for temporary measures. The problem with these levers is that they poor fitting to start off with. So they get this wiggle to them, which is unacceptable. So I've pulled them apart. This one's still to go. I'll pull it apart. I'll do some adjustments on these levers to make sure that they fit without making a racket when you ride the bike and have an even pull on them and then also if I can if I show you this lever the finish on it is very poor it almost looks like it has orange peel on it it doesn't look doesn't look too good at all it looks cheap 
So what I'm going to be doing is I'll be polishing up this lever to remove all of that so that it looks as good as the stem and the seat bust. And I've already had a trial on the bottom of that lever. And you can see the results that can be achieved on it. So on both these levers they'll be pulled apart, adjustments made, and then the actual lever part will be polished up to a high shine. And then he'll use that until he can find the correct period, correct levers to match the bike. So hopefully you'll be able to see what I was getting at with the orange peel on these levers. If you look at this lever and this lever now after I've polished it, let me turn this over. And this one. Sorry, I'm doing this one-handed again. So you can clearly see the difference between the two levers now. On one that's had a bit of polish, actually wet, wet paper and then polish. And auto saw. So this lever is looking a lot more traditional. Maybe not campy traditional, but uh, yes, at least it's got a nice polished finish as opposed to a very sort of cheap looking lever. So yeah, all the Colnago enthusiasts out there that collectively held their breasts when I mentioned a cheap Chinese part. Uh, Please have some forgiveness for this. Uh, we all do what we, we can do at certain times. And uh, as soon as originals can be sourced, uh, they will be replaced. Just doing a strip down of the Shimano 600 Tricolor group set. And uh, just wanted to show you why it's important to actually pull these things apart when doing a restoration. Because the middle pulley, you can see this wheel has been chewed up a little bit. And um, once I'd removed it, you actually see this kind of damage. Actually, if the part stayed on the bike and you had simply cleaned it, you wouldn't notice these things, especially if you're looking at the drive side of the bike like that. And strangely enough, this is the second 600 derailleur with exactly the same issue where this middle pulley has been chewed up. Um, my personal Peter Allen and I had the same same issue where I had a tooth missing as well. So this is the one with the ceramic center piece. So I'll have to go hunting for, for new wheels for this derailleur. And then you need to see some marks on this one. So I'll do a clean up here with the jeweler's file as well and just a little bit of water paper just to get those marks out of it and look, get it looking fresh. A little bit of road rash on the derailleur itself. Unfortunately, other than a little bit of tidying up and smoothing off, nothing much can be done here because you won't be able to match this color well enough. So I'll leave that as a patina effect on it. And then the front derailleur is actually looking looking fairly good. It's all cleaned up and ready to be put back together again. So there we go after the cleanup. Lots of elbow grease, a couple of drops of unicorn tears. And uh, the marks are, so to say, gone. Looking a lot better. Jeweler's file. 1200 grit, then 2000 grit, and then auto saw. Problem solved. Here's a quick shot of the 600 levers stripped down, ready for a deep clean. That's the back one that's already complete. And how to get started on this one. Take a look at Shimano's little trick to getting those calipers to move, move so smoothly. Those little ball bearings that fit between 
those two washers. Whereas the others we're just using friction plates. Those little ball bearings do the trick to get it to shift. Have a look at this pin. It's got a slight, slight banana shape to it. I'm going to have to give that a bit of a straightening. And then we'll take each part, clean it up individually, put it back together, and it'll be working like new again. Something worth mentioning while I'm busy with these brakes is your brake blocks. Many times when you restore, you want to keep the original brake blocks because you just can't get hold of the the old ones anymore. New old stock are hard to find in South Africa most of the time. So go through the brake blocks with a sharp pick, something like this. Even a needle will work. And look for debris sitting there. Very often you'll find old pieces of metal uh, stuck inside these grooves. I think there's one at the top there. So in, in that one you can see there's a piece of metal. And all this plays a part in damaging your room further every time you hit the brakes. And then over time the brakes will pick up the cupping as well. You can see it. That curved surface, the surface becomes curved. Sometimes just to poor alignment of the brake block as well. It's either too high or too low. So it's not making perfect contact with the face of the rim. So I'll often just put both brake blocks flat down on water paper. And then just run them across the water paper until you get a flat surface again to work on. And then it also removes the glazing that is built up over the years just from mostly from the heat of braking as well. Sometimes debris and uh, oils and contaminants. You get this shiny, shiny look to these brake blocks like these have currently. So just some water paper. Normally a 320 will work. And rub them down. Make sure everything's debris free. So this is the brake block that's been rubbed down with 320 on a flat surface. You can see the shine's gone off of it. And then I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see this, but let's try. You'll see that surface is flat. And you can see that surface is still cut. So let's carry on until we get them both the same. And then we're done with the brakes. Moving on to the cranks. Normally I won't touch a 600 crank. I'm quite fond of this coating that they put on it. But in this particular instance, I think this crank is too damaged. It's got a lot of scratches on it. It's well worn from cycling shoe. Just the general cleanup with polish is not going to get rid of any of this because it's got a coating on it. It's this coating that gives the 600 normally that wonderful shine or sheen rather. The non-drive side is not as bad when it comes to the scratches but the drive side is pretty bad so i think i'm going to take the rings off and i'm going to give this a polish take all this take this coating off polish it up i'll start with the, on the wheel with a fine scotch bright and then i'll hit it with a polishing, polishing pad and see what result i can get and then I'll either have the logo laser engraved back or I'll make a water decal and we'll see how that turns out. So that's the progress after a few minutes on a fine scotch brot wheel. So this is the pad I'm currently using. You can see it's, it's well worn. It's much slower process now when the pad gets to that stage. But it gives it a finer finish. You can see the scratches are really not that deep at all. And then once that's done, I'll use water paper. And then go in and clean all these knock marks on the crank. From uh, Conrad acting like a Rotarium racer at some stage in his life, I'm guessing. So we'll get all that polished and cleaned up. So let's take a quick look at the progress. This is the drive side. 
I still need to do it with 2000 wet paper. This is the paper here. Yeah? You can see the dull effect, still some scratches in it. I want to get all of those out. This is the non drive side, which has been hit with 2000 paper and then auto sole on the polishing wheel. And that's the result you're going to get out of it. Almost looks like chrome. Lovely shine. And that was auto sole on a polishing wheel mounted to my drilling machine, mounted into the vise. That's the kind of results you can expect from it. Now to move on to the drive side. Yeah, I was designing the 600 logo using the software that I use on my vinyl cutter and then sizing it correctly. A quick, quick look at the water transfers. Possibly slightly too big for the crank. You can measure them up but they turned out very nice. Applying the water slide decals. The decals themselves got three coats of clear coat, which was done in the garage. And then before you apply them, make sure that you clean the surface that you're working with, with rubbing alcohol first, so that you're getting a solid bond of the water decal. This is one of those rare resto jobs that you can actually do in the comfort of your lounge instead of being confined to the garage. Makes it a lot more enjoyable when you can watch the Jira at the same time. Moving on to the Spikes wheel set. Currently the front is running a Mavic MA40 rim and this is a mismatch to a Campy Omega so Conrad is looking at bringing this back to the MA40 fortunately for him I've managed to find an MA40 rim and then just something that we noticed on this rim uh, is that it's got hairline cracks you can see it there Something worth looking for if you're restoring these old bikes or if you're looking to purchase one. Look out for these kind of things on the bikes. You can see these, these little cracks forming. Let's see if I can find another one. There's one over there as well. So if at any stage you were looking at respoking this wheel, the chances are very good that the spokes will pull through the eyelets if there's crackings of cracks or there when you're trying to tension up the up the wheel so we'll pull this one apart and we'll relace it with new spokes onto a very good ma40 that i managed to source servicing the hubs on both front and rear hubs so it was fresh grease and fresh bearings in both hubs Just taking a quick look at the new, well rather, the old MA40 rim that I managed to find. And I've had it laced up and, uh, and fitted. So I just want to show you now this rim. You can see how dull it is. This has been lying in our rafters for a good couple of years. Probably the best part of 15 years, this rim. Um, and you can see very dull and plain looking. And I'm going to hit it with auto sole, just on a cloth, just with my finger, and polish it up. And we're gonna we're gonna see what kind of difference it can make on this room. Okay, so that's it. Just a little bit of auto sole. Put it on those three, and we can do a bit of comparison to the rest, and to the other side. So that's all I'm going to do, just spend some time so we're rubbing it in. Ok, 
Okay, so just showing you the versatility of auto saw. And see what this room looked like. How dull that is. And now. Just a few minutes of work. You can see the difference it brings out that color. Again, so yes, um, unfortunately not endorsed by Autosol at all. But um, this is one metal polish that you can use for many, many uses. Uh, works great on paint as well. Not too aggressive. And uh, you can see what it'll do to that old MA40. Now this is something you won't see me doing off and on on vintage bike and that's reusing bar tape uh, mostly because it's normally way beyond its sell by date or its usable date rather so this is uh, bar tape in fairly good nickel that I managed to get off without losing the sticky backing so it was clearly a good quality bar tape that was on the Colnago interesting almost like a gel pad it doesn't come off like the old traditional bar tape does. And it, and it feels like it's leather. So to clean this, I'll use some rubbing alcohol. And just a cloth. And then just wipe over it with that. So hope you'll, hopefully you'll be able to see where the, where the dirt is. And you can see where it's white and then the marks where the tape was overlapping where it was dirty. But just with a bit of rubbing from uh, rubbing alcohol, give it a wipe down, and you can bring that wipe back very quickly. So I'll go through the bar tape with that, and then I'll see if I can save it. Sometimes it's possible if it's not too uh, too stretched. Uh, the worst that can happen is it doesn't work, and I'll have to use new tape. But we always use what we can. Having a look at the well used roll saddle. These saddles were obviously hugely popular in the day and they remain collectible till today. This one had obviously seen a lot of use and I dropped it off together with three other of my saddles with Musa Meli Clarsons who works on bridge cycles in Cape Town. He's an absolute wizard when it comes to covering saddles and as you can see he delivered something spectacular. I can highly recommend him. So after lots of time and effort, it's finally time to put this beauty back together again. Can't wait to see the final product on it. And there she is in all her glory. So that's a wrap on this Colnago Super Restoration. If you're still with me, it's been a long video, thanks for hanging around. I hope you enjoyed it. Please hit that, that subscribe button. It'll be good to have you on board and you'll be notified of my future videos. A huge thank you to Conrad for entrusting me with this bike. I know it's something special to him and uh, it was somewhat nerve-wracking to me to actually do the restoration on this. Mainly because Conrad has basically been an icon in my life. In the time that he was competing on the international stage based out of California, I myself was racing locally in endurance adventure races and mountain biking events. It was a time in my life where I really enjoyed 
the sport, was actively involved in it, and he was one of those people who was an absolute hero. He was someone I always looked up to, he was someone who I followed closely, and, uh, and he remains a humble, down-to-earth, honest gentleman, a true attribute to South African sport, and a man who has always flown the South African colours highly. I trust Conrad will still get many years usage out of the bike. It won't just become a decoration piece above his coffee machine. <laughs> and that he'll be joining us on our Sunday vintage rides. I personally love doing this restoration. I love how the bike turned out. That pearlescent colour is certainly eye-catching. Truly a beautiful machine. One which I could quite easily add to my own collection. As I mentioned earlier, Conrad is looking at taking this bike back to see record components throughout. So if you're sitting on a set or you're sitting with parts, generation 1, generation 2, see record groupers, please get hold of him on the link on his website. You'll find an email address over there. I'm sure he'll appreciate it, even if it's one or two bits. It all adds up to collecting these parts. They're extremely rare to get hold of in South Africa. Uh, sometimes fetching top dollar for us, obviously, on eBay. The South African Rand sadly cannot compete with any of the international currencies on the euro and, and the dollar. So, thanks for following the video. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed the restoration. And we'll see you on the next one.